To touch my heart, communicate with impact. Ideas are the currency of the 21st century. And your ability to communicate your ideas persuasively is the single greatest skill you can choose to develop. But spreading your ideas in the 21st century requires a 21st century model of communication. And in communicating any idea, our role as the communicator is to engage our audience, enlighten them, teach them something, and we want it to be enduring. We want them to remember and act on it. To be able to do that, we use hugs. So let me introduce you to hugs. Hugs is all about touch my heart, it's the H, understand me, my needs, my issues, give me something new, something that I can use as a solution, and tell me a story. Today I'm going to share an idea, and it's my story. It's about how one simple encounter changed my life forever. And during this story, I'm going to freeze frame the story itself and talk about what's happening inside the brain. So I believe when you understand what is happening inside the brain during communication, particularly during stories, then you will be able to apply it effectively to any communication of any idea. So where do we begin? Well, when we begin to communicate an idea, we have to start somewhere, and the beginning is a very good place. Where is the beginning? Typically, we begin with where we are, who's involved, with what. This helps our brains establish the context and put your audience at ease. So meet Barry. I first met Barry outside a very, very rough pub in the south part of a northern city in the UK where I was working in a college. <coughs> My role at that time was heading up an EU-funded access course that was designed to get unemployed, low or no education, no qualification individuals into university. It was one of the UK's little tricks to reduce the number of unemployed youths prowling the streets. And Barry was a hard, hard man. He was a skinhead. But he was exactly the sort of customer that the course was designed for. If you met Barry going down the street, if you saw him, the best advice is cross the road or walk the other way. But because he was this ideal customer, I approached Barry and his mates. And I gave Barry a flyer, which he promptly crumpled up and suggested where I might insert. <laughs> now my mama did raise no fool, so I backed straight off and walked away. A couple of weeks later, imagine my surprise when Barry walks into the classroom where I'm conducting the first day's class. My students were for the very first time ever silent, studying their textbooks in temple. Barry demanded to know what this was all about as he gave me back the crumpled flyer. Now this is in the days well before mobile phones, so nobody was going to be videotaping this for YouTube posterity. Nobody was going to call the police and we were all scared. So I called him over to one corner of the room 
hoping that at least one of my students will be able to slip out the door, call security, and protect us. But no, they continued <coughs> carrying on. But Barry came down and sat down, and he talked to me about what had happened to him. He'd been expelled from school at the age of 15 years for fighting. He had no qualifications, no O levels, And every time he went for a job, because he looked the way he looked, nobody would hire him. They were scared of him. So all he could do was wander the streets with his mates, collect his dollar money, and carry on. But why do we use a story? Why am I telling you a story? Well, brain scans reveal that stories stimulate and engage our brains. It helps the speaker connect with the audience. Make it much more likely that you will remember what is happening and potentially empathize with the characters of the story. And from a story perspective, what I want to do is continuously increase the tension. Once that story has resonated and kept your attention for long enough, you will engage with the characters, you will begin to empathize with them. Thanks to a little chemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It's what you feel towards your child when your child is born. It is what you feel, I hope and pray, for your spouse or your partner. <laughs> It's because of this thing we have in our brains called mirror neurons that enable us to feel into the story. And if the characters of the story engage you long enough, you will empathize with them. And that enables us to help the social cues inside our normal behavior to respond and perhaps help that individual or want a good resolution for that character in the story. And what we also need to know about is this area at the front of our head, the front of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, or the PFC. It's known very often as the executive center of the brain. But I think of it as a theater stage. When you have a thought, it's like putting an actor on stage. And at any time, you can have three or maybe four actors on the stage. Think, for example, how you remember telephone numbers. If it's more than eight digits, you will remember it in two, three, or even four chunks of data. There will be double numbers or triple numbers or even numbers of four. You remember that because that's how much you can keep on the stage at the time. But as you're trying to pay attention to what I'm saying, all the time you're thinking, oh, I wonder what I'm going to have for my main course. I wonder what it's going to be like. Uh, I've got a party tonight. Um, you've got something else going on. Your thought life continues unabated. And all of this time, I want your attention. And keeping your attention uses a huge amount of energy, like the spotlights on the theatre stage. And your, en your energy is used very wisely by the way. And it will shift attention to something that it deems more worthy of attention. Whatever that is, even if it's the gentle hum of the air conditioning. So what do we do with a story? Well, the job of the story layer is to continuously bring across the facts or the information of the story from the beginning through the middle to its ending. And it's like turning on hot and cold taps. Cold taps for cold hard data, the facts, and the hot for the emotional component, whatever you are trying to convey. Because then I can touch the heart, and if I touch the heart with the story, you are more likely to remember But it's completely useless if I don't get your attention in the first place. I need your attention. So 
So how do we do that? Well, again, let's look inside the brain and find out what's happening inside the brain. And this time we'll need to know about another part of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex. It's just behind the prefrontal cortex. And another small area, just at the bottom of the prefrontal cortex, known as the nucleus accumbens. What's happening inside of these? Well, remember this PFC theatre. The actors, the noise from outside, your inner thought life, is all vying for your attention, trying to tell you that it's important. But is it important? Well, that's the job of your anterior cingulate cortex. When your anterior cingulate cortex recognizes something as new, as different, as potentially threatening, it will force you to pay attention to that item, neglecting something else in your prefrontal cortex. That's its job. It's constantly on alert, like a trigger happy security guard. Anything new, any sudden movement, will attract your attention because it may be threatening. That will trigger the anterior cingulate cortex to speak to the amygdala. The amygdala is just here. The amygdala that I'm sure you've heard of is known as the emotional seat of our brain. And that triggers the production of cortisol. We like cortisol in stories because cortisol increases distress. I want you to feel just a little bit anxious. Sufficiently anxious to know what The other part of our brain is, that we're looking at here, is the nucleus accumbens. This produces dopamine. Dopamine is a happy chemical. It's when you feel joy, it's thanks to the nucleus accumbens. So what I want to do with the story is I want to increase distress to the point where you're anxious enough to know what happens next, what happens next. But also give you some joy, some satisfaction because dopamine helps us to consolidate memory. Whereas too much cortisol impairs your memory. And I'm sure you've all felt great stress at some point, wondering simple things like where are the keys to the car? Are? What did you do with the children? And literally you cannot remember because your brain is impaired by too much cortisol. Too much joy, is it possible to have too much joy? It's unlikely, it's unlikely. A great story, what we want to do is get a balance. We want you to feel empathy with the characters or the situation of the story whilst giving you some satisfaction. Great speakers, Steve Jobs, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, always switch between distress and happiness. What the situation is now, bad, to what it could be, good. Bad, good, bad, good. Until finally there's a resolution. This is how we will change the world. <clears throat> so let's go back to Barry. Barry's lack of formal education really came to the fore. He completely flunked his first assignment. He was not a happy brother. He really was upset. He came to me after class. I'm alone in a basement classroom with a man who still frightens me to death. But Barry tells me just how upset he is, not with me, thankfully, but with himself. He tells me some of the reasons he was kicked out of school, the situations he'd gotten involved in. But what upset him the most was that according to his very absent father from being a very young man, was that all he was ever good for was looking hard. But I take my time with Barry and slowly but surely his grades improve. They're not brilliant, but he passes. He manages to do enough. And by the end of the year, he applies to the top-notch school of the University of IT. It was renowned for only taking the best of the very best. Simple parents will understand this. <laughs> he wanted to get in, that's what he wanted to do. But with his grades, 
would he be able to do so? The problem, you see, for most communication is that it's cold tech only. It's cold facts data. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Numbers, numbers, numbers. And everybody just falls asleep. Because it doesn't touch the heart at all. And what happens is we layer on all the facts after fact after fact, and half of that information, if not more, simply leaks out because there's nothing for us to consolidate in our memory. A report, typically, is like this. It conveys facts full of data, and it's dull and boring. How many meetings have you been to, been to where they are just dull and boring? But the job of the report, after all, is to convey those facts, the numbers, the updates. But there's no heart and no soul. So nobody really pays attention. Nobody wants to know this. So how do we enliven even the dullest of meetings where you've got to just report facts? Well, why? Does that person need to know this? What's in it for them? We need to understand what's in it for them. We need to understand them. And then we need to touch their heart. And we can use the same principles in any type of communication. No matter what you're trying to do, whether you're inspiring a new belief, trying to be dramatic, or simply reporting the facts. We start thinking that there is a happiness or a status quo line. And what we need to do is dig the pain of if we don't do something, this is what happens. Martin Luther King did this beautifully in his I Have Dreams. This is what happens if we maintain the status quo. But we also need to build the game, provide satisfaction, get some dopamine that will release some of the tension to make us feel good. And if you can do this repeatedly through your story, you can keep people's attention. You can convey the information. Because every time I dig a little bit of tension and I leave what is known as the cliffhanger in dramatic problems, you want to fill in the blanks. You want to know what happens. But you will fill in your blanks based on your experience, your knowledge, your life. You might be negative, you might be positive, but you will fill in your blanks because your brain craves certainty. It needs answers. The job of the story is to provide that in a timely manner. I didn't hear anything from that. My project had come to an end, my inquiries, of others who had just met with struggles. Nobody knew what had happened to them. My project had ended, I'd got the funding, I'd set up the course, I'd got the first recruit. It was time for me to move on. So I didn't move on. I went to Paris, which was a delightful place. Then I went to Dusseldorf, and apologies if you're from Dusseldorf, that's another delightful place. <laughs> <coughs> then I went over to Hong Kong, and finally I came to Singapore. And some 10 years have gone by. I'm invited to run a workshop back in the UK. And I've got 50 people in the room. And we're halfway through the first day of the workshop. And Barry sneaks in through the back door. He's shaven bald now. Scars on his face still evident. He still looks as hard as he ever did. But something happened. And it came to me after the break, speaking very softly, something he'd never done before. We sit for coffee and he tells me that he'd gotten into US, his top notch school. He'd graduated with honors. And now he'd set up a video production company that was making community style videos for getting unemployed youths and disadvantaged children off the streets and particularly off drugs and blue and giving them opportunities. 
And the area where I first met him outside that pub is one of the roughest places in that town. And he's been very active in the local community, changing it, helping the council, working with them to make the environment a better place. Then Barry went quiet, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, Thank you. He told me that I'd been the first person ever in his life to give him a chance. The first person who believed him, who helped him. And I'd inspired him to do the same for others. He now knew that he could change his community, change the lives of hundreds and thousands of youngsters, disadvantaged youngsters, and change it into people who would be proud to do something spectacular with their lives. And he told me that when you believe in someone, give them a chance and pour your life into them. You too can change the world. We spent the evening together. We were watching the videos that he produced, very, very good videos. And I asked him how he went about it. So here it is. He told me, you show them that you care, understand them and their success, their issues, give them something they can use, and entertain them with a story. Touch. Touch my heart. Understand who I am, what I need. Give me something I can use and tell me a story. We spent some more time and he told me how you go about creating stories. What do you need to do? But my time is up. I will have to wait for another day. To summarise, isn't this what we all want to do? We want our ideas to touch people's lives to have an impact, no matter what the communication is. We want to help the people we serve to help them identify the greatness that is within them and how to work it out. It's been a pleasure.